so but it was really fun super fun to play and super fun to play with like friends of mine like Bela Fleck and Antonio Sanchez and Zakir Hussein and so yeah man um Michael thank you so much for doing this uh it's uh really cool to get to talk to you again <laughs> absolutely man my pleasure nice to see yeah. you again yeah I know, time. I know last time was like a restaurant in Mumbai somewhere I guess <laughs> yeah <laughs> so uh i guess one of the first things i want to know was uh i found out that you were in barcelona for example so yeah i wanted to know about what the move has been like for you and uh yeah you know like moving out there and doing the ground up festival and all those kind of things like what has that been like i mean pers- i i really love it i love i love uh, being here you know i definitely loved living in new york um which was a very different kind of life but now i live in the middle of the countryside and a uh, very small village and things are much slower and kind of livable here you know um and uh and actually you know it hasn't slowed down my work at all you know i wasn't really worried about that happening but it, there's always a possibility moving to a smaller place that's farther from the center of the the music world that i live in you know uh, um but it's actually been really really awesome like i stay you know i have a studio here in my house so musicians are coming here and the kind of experience we have here is very different from the kind of experience you have in a studio in New York where you're like watching the clock and thinking about how much money you're spending and you know so uh i've kind of tried to kind of tried to create a little oasis for myself here oh nice yeah and that includes the festival i'm guessing right like how did that go down well there was ne- the plan was never to have ground up music festival in prats it only happened prats uh, prats is the name of the village so i just people call it Pratt's. Um, uh, the, it was never the plan to do it here. We normally do it in Miami, but because we had to postpone it due to COVID, um, I didn't want to go a year, especially our, our, I think it was our fifth year, without um, throwing a festival, you know? So we decided to do a very, very small version, like right here in the village. It was only uh, for people who live in the village, only for residents. No one from outside was allowed to come in. And we filmed it and we streamed it. So that was like the really, um, a, a really interesting kind of business model, you know, because uh, it was like a gift for the people in the village who normally don't have a lot of access to music. Wow, yeah, that's really cool. And I'm, I'm guessing like, you know, you got to curate this and, and you know, you got to really, I mean, I know you usually curate it, but yeah, like that you got to curate it in this space and, uh, you know, see a new audience, I'm guessing. So um, yeah, like, uh, uh, it, coming to coming to the album itself like I wanted to ask you about that like because uh, I was listening to it a few times and I was listening to the singles when they came out I still remember even when uh, Right Where I Fall came out and uh, especially even the actor like I I think like sorry In Your Mouth yeah like when I remember seeing the music videos to those two songs I was um, really taken in by you know like what you were doing with this record so uh, I guess uh, one of the first things I wanted to ask you was what was the sort of starting point for it in that sense, like uh, thematically or even just uh, in an overall aesthetic sense? I mean, the, the record was written during the pandemic. And so a lot of those things that we were all thinking during the pandemic were on my mind, I guess. Um, so I think maybe, yeah, the record has a bit of a darker tone than people would expect. But actually, you know, to me, Starkey Puppy's music is a little dark. It just doesn't have lyrics, so you can't really like pigeonhole it as being dark. But a lot of the songs that I write, I think in general are dark. So I it surprised a lot of people that a lot of the kind of concepts that were being discussed weren't like shiny, happy concepts. But I mean, I'm a very happy person, but you know, I'm a person. So there's like, you know, a variety of perspectives and emotions. And that's really what the record is about is perspectives. You know, the record really is about different perspectives and about all of the kind of people that live inside of every individual and and who we are and how dynamic we are as human beings. And um, so with dynamics, there's going to be, you know, light and dark. And so, uh, uh, yeah, a lot of the songs kind of took on a little bit of a darker character, not just lyrically, but also kind of musically and texturally. And and I like that because it's intriguing, you know. and and I, and I, I like I said I feel like I use that kind of mood in a, in in a lot of different bands when I'm writing. So, um, but of course when you assign images like a music video with my face in it and then lyrics, it you know 
pinpoints the thing a little a little sharper than with like an instrumental band you know yeah and sonically um you know i can hear so much going on here in the sense of there is i mean there is just so much diversity right like uh even in i think one of the i forget which track but like there was definitely like an indian dhol sort of thing going on i think that was the last friend or was that fireside i'm, I'm trying to remember um, uh i, I played dawul which is like indian dhol but uh, dawul is uh the, the turkish version of dhol uh -huh. um i played that on quite a few songs but fireside it's definitely big on that um touch me on the bridge yeah i mean there's a lot of a lot of songs where there's dawul yeah yeah, so I mean, could you tell me a bit about that um, Middle Eastern, Turkish, you know, like those kind of influences that you brought to this record? Because, you know, I know that you did it in a way that you made sure that, you know, this is not just me like appropriating this stuff, you know, like this is me embedding myself into it, learning this stuff and, you know, doing it with, with, a, with as respectfulness as possible. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm a, I, I, I study those instruments. So like currently study, I'm a student of my teacher is a guy named Tarek Aslan, and um, I have another one named Erdemero. So they, they, these are the two guys living in Turkey that are teaching me various Turkish percussion instruments from Erbane, Daf, which is like a circular frame drum with rings that's popular in Kurdistan and, and especially kind of Iran. Um, and then Dohola, uh, Sumbati, Solo, which are like ceramic darbukas with goat or fish skin heads. And then Dawu and Rick, you know, like Arabic kind of tambourine. Um, so these, I've been taking lessons from these guys. And of course, what, you know, when you're practicing an instrument, you come up with things that are your own, you know, you manipulate a rhythm and you follow that path. And then pretty soon you have your own kind of interpretation of that rhythm. And um, so, uh, you know, I definitely had a, included a lot of those things that I was coming up with while I was practicing, but also I was thinking about, well, I don't play drum set and this is a pop record what would it sound like to kind of fulfill the same role as a drum set but using these textures from turkey and morocco that i normally wouldn't hear in pop music you know so it was really interesting because you know i'm using kind of compound textures um to create the feeling of a drum set, but without thinking like, okay, well, this is going to be the kick drum, this is going to be the snare, this, you know, but like not thinking of it so literally, but just thinking of it as like, how does a drum set make a chorus feel? And what, how do I do that? Okay, well, then I'll do like the Rick, like the little symbols on the Rick to give me some high-end presence. I'll use Bombo Leguero from Colombia or something to do a bass drum sound. I'll use maybe the Dohola to fill in the middle or, you know, and it was just trial and error. I mean, it was just like seeing what worked. Yeah, fair enough. And uh, like, I guess uh, I have to ask you about, uh, you know, In Your Mouth, because that was a video that really stood out for me. And that was it's just the whole presentation of it was just so powerful. And, you know, I sense that it's not just about, you know, what happened in America. And, you know, it's not just about Donald Trump. Like, you know, it feels like it's about it has a larger message that way. Right. Yeah, that's why we didn't want to show the faces of any of the, the cardboard politicians you know hmm. um because uh, i mean it's very easy to just say like this guy is a jerk you know and 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 but then you focus the message in a way that becomes unrelatable and uh, to a certain extent when that person is then gone you know and i always feel like when songwriting there's kind of a magic equilibrium of saying something specific and personal while at the same time keeping the language broad enough to where people can create their own interpretation or their own association with that song. So In Your Mouth is just about any leader that's not doing a great job, you know? Um, and about people who get sick of being governed by people like that. That's kind of the idea. So in the end, the actors in the video are taking all of the the uh, BS, for lack of a better term, that is spewed by these politicians that, in the, that takes the form of paper, you know, in the video that they're covered in paper, there's paper on the floor. This is symbolizing the, 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 the hatred and the, the fear and all the kind of stuff that politicians foment sometimes. 
and they're taking it and shoving it back in their in their in the politicians' mouths. And that's the kind of idea. And I think really anyone from any country could relate to that. If you have a leader that's governing in a way that serves their own interests over the interests of the of the people. Yeah. And you know what you were saying just now about how like you know it leaves enough space for that interpretation. And uh, you know, I think obviously like you mentioned earlier as well, Snarky Puppy's music being instrumental does that, you know, like it means different things to different people. And, you know, um, so obviously when you add, when you add lyrics to something and when you add words to something, uh, you know, on a very basic level, it leads people to interpret it a certain way. Um, so what was that challenge like for you, you know, to, to write something and write something for yourself, especially that, you know, would be interpreted a certain way, but not getting too hung up on how it was being interpreted by people. I think every time you write a song, you might say, okay, this song is about whatever, X. But then as soon as you start to write the lyrics to the song, you immediately create another world. At a certain point, you stop describing your initial idea and you start describing the world that you're creating. You know, I mean, I don't think, anyone writes a song it's like it was sunday and i went to the store and then i bought some cornflakes and then i you know it's never just like a it's like you start to become creative and artistic you know i mean as you must be when you're composing something and and you start taking liberties artistic and creative liberties right and you start saying well this is what i wanted to say but it'll sound more beautiful if i say this and it'll actually create a new avenue that i can explore and Blah, 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 blah. So at a certain point when I was writing that song, it stopped being about Donald Trump making people afraid of immigrants and Muslims and whatever, all the crap he did, you know? I mean, among many other things. And it started just being about this world that I created. And normally when I write songs, I start thinking about like, like as if it were a film or a music video or something. And so I was seeing this kind of like, warehouse full of like citizens in like lines like thousands and thousands of lines like, like all kind of wearing doctor's outfits <laughs> like just totally like but like torn outfits you know totally ready to just shove this pill back into the the guys whoever this guy's or girl's you know face was you know the one that 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 beat them down um so it's kind of like a song about about revenge in a certain way but only giving someone the medicine that they that they gave you you know no more you know not not like a i don't know it's i, I mean and then you start getting into the i don't know when i was writing it then i started getting into the language of it and the wordplay and there's obviously a lot of like sexual you know uh like you know double uh double meanings and all this kind of stuff um, that also is fun to kind of play around with and explore. And, um, and then, like I said, it just becomes its own animal. And in the end, it's not about Donald Trump. It's just about it, the thing that it's about. And that's the beauty of the creative process, I think. Yeah. And I think, uh, I feel like, you know, like, um, especially in, in this sort of record, you could tell there's a very deeply like personal sort of like, you know, intention with, with a lot of this. And um, I mean, surely that's, that's not always easy, right? Like, I mean, uh, so I, I wanted to ask you whether there was something that you felt came from a very deeply personal space in the sense that it was almost uncomfortable to share, but then you were like, I have to do this. There's a song on the record called I Wonder Who You Know. It was like the third, it wasn't really a single. It was like the song that we re that we released the music video for when the album came out. It's actually my favorite song on the record. Um, and that song is like about my family, you know, <laughs> like very directly. But, but once again, it like started with this idea of, okay, this song is about something that happened in my family. But then you start, writing the story and the story takes on its own life and becomes its its own thing. So you could, you know, distill it and say, this song is about this, but it's really not. It's like started with that idea. And, and it actually got to the point where that there were certain phrases I was writing. I was like, Ooh, it almost, 
sounds too personal. I, I, I like, I don't know. I always like when this is a very personal um, taste of mine, but I don't like when I hear someone perform and it feels like therapy. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I like, I like when an artist has like, even if it's just 5% of this kind of objectivity in the way that they perform that, um, that makes you feel like they think of music as music and not music as like, like, this is my story. And if you don't like my song, you don't like me. And you know, like this kind of thing that sometimes you feel, you see artists on stage and you're like, oh my God, you know, like, it's like a little too much. Like I, I like when an artist has this kind of like ability to float up outside of their own head and, and, and check out what's going on on their own stage or, the, or their own disc. And, um, and so for that reason, there were certain phrases in that song that made me feel like, eh, I didn't write that phrase talking about my experience. I wrote it because I thought it was right in the context of the song, but maybe we'll, people will hear it and think that I meant that, you know, um, so yeah, that it crossed some like, you know what I mean? Yeah, it all gets mixed up at some point. And then like you realize that it's all got mixed up. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. But then in the end, I was like, you know what? It's telling the story. It's telling the story I want to tell. And that's all I can really hope for you know yeah <laughs> so yeah i mean and you know I, I saw that video as well and it was quite powerful to go with the, the song and everything um and yeah i guess i wanted to know in, by way of what, what else is sort of coming up on that front like with the album in terms of promotions and things like that well the vinyl will be available next month so that'll be fun you know it's been out for a couple months and uh i've been really happy with the way it's it's always hard as like a first album artist you know especially on an independent label it's like you know it's not like I'm Jesse J or something it's not like there's this huge company with a lot of money pushing my thing out it was really <laughs> the objective of the record was really just to reach people and express this part of my musicianship which has always been there I've always been singing songs and writing songs since I was a kid and um but people might not think of me that way because they might only know Snarky Puppy or something or Bocante or whatever. Um, so that was kind of like the goal was just to make, put a little light on this part of who I am as a musician and, and to have fun and to express something new. And, and I loved it. I loved the process. So at this point, yeah, I mean, I'm doing things like this. I'm doing interviews. Um, I've been doing this Instagram live series. Uh, I just started with, we did one with Laura Mvula. I'm going to do one with Kimbra. I'm going to do one with Susana Baca and Silvana Estrada. You know, it's just fun to like chat with musicians and talk about this stuff. I'm also like kind of on my Instagram page, I'm, I'm going to start going into like the Pro Tool sessions and showing what's going on and, you know, in kind of a geekier way, a less artistic way, like in the video. So yeah, I mean, just trying to, I just want people to listen to it. I want people to hear the record. I want to keep people paying attention to it because I, I feel that it's a record that it grows on you. It's not, not something that maybe smacks you on the side of the head the first time you hear it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, like, I know that the collaborations, you know, continue on, like, uh, alongside, like, you that you have one with, uh, you know, Purbaya and Chatterjee on uh, Unbounded. So, yeah, like, I wanted to ask you about that. Like, how did that come about for you? And what has that been like for you being part of that record? Oh, super cool. Purbaya called me and, like, you know, said, you want to be a part of this? And I was like, man, are you kidding? Yeah, of course. So, uh i mean the songs were really hard you know <laughs> so but it was really fun super fun to play and super fun to play with like friends of mine like Ayla fleck and antonio sanchez and zakir hussein and um really nice and and also to play with people that i had never played with like shankar and, and Purbayan and you know so it was uh you know beautiful really really beautiful and i'm so happy to see that it's having so much success um for such an ambitious album i think sufi score is doing a great job promoting it and i think purbayan is also doing a great job i'm i'm jealous i wish i, I should have uh you know uh hired them to do my record in india you know <laughs> <laughs> right um and yeah lastly i guess yeah since i am sort of calling from india like um i i know that you guys played here and you know uh you had you you came back here one time as well so yeah i just wanted to know about uh uh 
also about yeah just your connection to india as it continues and uh you know the fans out here who obviously continue bumping snaggy puppy and all your other projects yeah well i mean india you know I, i mean i don't have to tell you you know it's a very very special place in the world i mean one of the more unique places i think you can go um on earth and um i think one of the main things about that is just you know people and culture you know that that these things are very strong you feel them immediately when you go and um so i love it I, I, you know i i actually used to date a, a girl from mumbai so i was going to india a lot you know i was going every every month or every two months for a little while and um so i i really uh it definitely kind of grabbed my my heart you know and i'm always waiting for like the email that says all right tour dates in india you know uh and unfortunately it doesn't that email does not come very often you know we start about we played in at mehboob and and bandra and and mumbai one time and that was the only time i've ever played in india i i came back you know i did some clinics um at the true school and stuff when i was visiting my my ex girlfriend but um yeah you know i'd love to I'd love to come back as soon as possible. So whether that's with Bill Lawrence and Duo or Bocante or Snarky Puppy or maybe even doing my solo thing which I've never done a gig with my solo thing but could be cool um or with any other group, you know, I, I would absolutely love to go. Right. Yeah. Um all right Michael, yeah, that's that's about it. Uh you know, thank you so much for taking the time out. Real glad always talking to you. And uh Bye yeah. Pleasure, um looking forward to more of course so thanks a lot <laughs> my pleasure man absolutely thanks for having me